Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the National Constitution Center. And I am here with one of our scholars. You guys, if you've come to class on Wednesdays before, you've seen Tom a lot, but we have more than one scholar at the Constitution Center. So we're really excited that Nick has joined us today. Nicholas Moskowitz is, uh, a, he has a PhD, he has a JD, he's super crazy smart. Um, and Nick, I'm not wrong to say free speech is probably one of your favorite topics, right? I know you have a lot of favorites. Uh, everything about the Constitution is interesting, Curry. That's the answer. <laughs> nice. Good answer, sir. Good answer. Um, so we have 30 minutes. If you guys all have questions when we go through this class, feel free to put it in the chat. But here's my guy, big questions to start with. And I always like to frame it. So we're going to talk about and we're going to ask Nick, all, tell us all about the founding generation and what they thought of when they were putting the First Amendment into the Constitution and kind of why sometimes it feels a little bit like a grab bag of rights all pulled together as one. So Nick's going to help us understand why those grab bag of rights actually connect. Second question that I have is, how has the First Amendment, and focusing on speech, how has it been tested um, over time? And what is our nation's commitment at different time periods to free speech? And then how has the court interpreted it over time? So we have a lot of court cases that we're going to go through today, but a lot of really interesting stories and fascinating stories. And I think this is one of my favorite classes because you feel the zigzag of right over time in this one, probably more than any other class. So Nick, I'll kick it over to you to start with. You want to kick off the big idea, then we'll dive into the text, and then we'll run from there. Sure, and uh, you know, it may be worth saying at the beginning that it's funny the way you asked the question, but within that hidden within that premise is a truth, which is there is a bit of a grab bag in here. We'll get to the framing of this, but in fact, James, uh, James Madison's original draft separated some of these five freedoms into different amendments. Um, so. It is interesting that at once we're going to talk about the core of the First Amendment. We'll get to that freedom of conscience, but there's also alongside it, there is just some truth to that, that these five freedoms were fold together because that tells us a little bit about how the First Amendment was actually written. So the big idea here is, is one that's important because Curry mentioned the zigzagging, which is historically true, but when it comes to today, and really, I would say the last five decades or so, um, speech protection has been stronger than any time in our nation's history. And uh, First Amendment freedoms uh, under the Constitution are, are arguably as strong as uh, free speech protection anywhere. Uh, so there, uh, I, I, as, as we say, amongst the strongest in the world, may be the strongest, although we, we can't necessarily say that. Um, but... And I think that, just to jump in, Nick, I think that's really interesting when we think about the First Amendment, and thank you, and we'll dive into the words now, we'll look at that grab bag first, then we're going to laser in on the speech part, but when we think about speech and go through these, this timeline, you know, of court cases, comparing us to the rest of the world, in the premise of protecting free speech today, we're very, very different. So what a great current event activity for other for the classes and the students to go see what free speech is like in other countries. And I'll send you a link in the chat with us. Well, we, we just got that. a chat from Uriel who says that in her country, you cannot burn the flag. And we could, yep. uh, that's Johnson versus United States. Although there's actually more than one Supreme Court case about flame burning in the 20th century. There are multiple cases, but it all comes down to the same conclusion, which is that's a form of expressive speech. Um, that the First Amendment protects. As difficult as that is, as offensive as that is to most people, um, it is protected. And that's exactly what we're getting at, Curry, right? Is that even compared to other democracies in our allies and such who have constitutional systems, the First Amendment's unique. Um, and the Supreme Court's jurisprudence over time reflects that. It's very speech protective. So what's in it? What's in that text? That leads us directly to that, right? Um, uh, and I know we want to go through this piece by piece because you all want to know this. What's in it? What isn't in it? Congress shall make no law. We've underlined that for a reason. We will explain as we go through why the First Amendment applies to the states now. But as originally drafted, we're talking about the national government doing something, right? Shall make no law. 
So uh, that doesn't mean absolute freedom of speech and press. It means that the uh, government cannot prescribe certain limitations that hence the abridging of the freedom of speech or of press. So we're not speaking in absolutes, even though I just said this very speech protective, right? So yes, it is, but that doesn't mean the government can't regulate any speech. It simply cannot abridge the freedom of speech or the press. And it's the job of the courts and the people over time to figure out exactly what that means. Um, and yes, there's five freedoms in there. We're focused on speech and press, but Curry's showing you the other one. We have um, the religious freedom clauses, that's the established clause and uh, the free exercise clause. We have the right of the people to peacefully assemble, which brings with it what we call the uh, right of association. That is sort of the right of people to act in concert, which sometimes involves speech and press as well. So it's a way of keeping in mind, by the way, First Amendment rights often work in concert with each other. So when Curry asks about historic examples, some of the historic examples we can bring up are precisely that. They're uh, First Amendment freedoms working in concert with each other. The final one is uh, the right to petition government for redress of grievances. We talk historically, that was amongst the most important freedoms that was put in here because um, uh, the right petition was thought to be essential to um, what it meant to have a free representative government. So that's the text. I'll pause there so we can- Yeah, uh, great, per perfect. And I try to color code it as you went through so you could see the different colors, meaning the different parts. We're kind of grouping press and speech together. The two religion clauses we're gonna do next week together. And then assembly and petition is the following week of classes. But before we dive into and do that deep dive into speech and press, Nick, can you explain, like, again, you said it earlier, the freedom of conscience. So mm -hmm. sometimes these pieces feel disconnected, but when Matt and Madison had them separated, but they do wrap together really nicely. And so what is that big understanding that the First Amendment is in some ways above others because it protects your right to be who you are? Um, so kind of wrap that together for us and then we'll start breaking it apart again. Yeah, well, so Mad Madison's original uh, Fifth Amendment, in fact, did have certain limitations on the states, and there are three of them. Three essential rights, he thought, needed to be protected against state and national interference. Those were the right to a jury trial, freedom of uh, speech uh, in, or press, and the right to conscience. Now, you know that didn't end up in the Bill of Rights. We know that because we're talking about this First Amendment before us. <clears throat> but that original draft reflected just how important Madison and certainly the other founders thought um, this right of conscience was. And why was it so essential? <clears throat> While it's one of these core natural rights that the founding generation was focused on. We, we talk about natural rights. We talk about those um, uh, those rights given to you uh, by God or nature is a result of being a human being. They're pre-governmental rights. You have them as by nature of existing as a human being, not by being a member of a government. Uh, and that's in the Declaration of Independence. That's some of that famous language that we, we all know well. Um, and so the right of conscience or the freedom of conscience was one of those core natural rights. Um, and it related to the freedoms within here, right? It's, we talk about William Penn, for instance, as an example of this freedom of conscience. And he was arrested in uh, 1670. And he was ar arrested for assembly, unlawful assembly, um, uh, with a number uh, Quaker member who were uh, preaching in public. Um, but he asserted his right to conscience and uh, convinced the jury to not convict him of the crime. And that conscience rights was larger just than the right to assembly. It was the right to speak. It was the right to one's own thoughts and beliefs that that conscience could not be controlled by others, nor alienated to a government to control. Um, and so that's that essential notion, right? That's why it connects these, um, uh, these rights together is we have this great Madison quote, 
the rights of conscience and opinion must equally uh, be equally and completely exempted from government regulation. The point being, conscience creates opinion because conscience is the thing by which your beliefs and opinions, uh, thoughts flow from. Uh, and to control those, to try to regulate those, is to regulate everything. Um, it's 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 too essential. So that's why we're talking about this background value behind all the First Amendment uh, freedoms of being this right to conscience. Awesome. Um, giving us kind of that framing. I have, we have a group of elementary school kids with us today, too. And this is actually, I think, a, this is why I love when we have elementary school teachers and students with us, because they ask really hard, stumpy questions. So here's the question. When we're thinking about this as you have a right and you have freedom of speech, what's the difference between those words? So what is a right? And can you give us an example? And again, we're trying to keep this in like language where we can access it. And then what is freedom? And how do those two kind of interplay with each other? Yeah, it is. It is a, it's a hard question <laughs> precisely one, right? <laughs> because the, con the contours that is sort of the framing or the borders of them are unclear because they often they do interplay. They are similar in, in some respects. Rights, rights language itself changes over time. So one way of answering this is saying, historically, the meaning of rights is different and contingent in a way that it isn't today. Today, we tend to think of rights both as uh, sort of these essential liberties or fundamental rights, which some of those would be these could include the natural rights, but they're there are things like freedom of speech, things like those in the Bill of Rights, but as well as other things like a right to privacy. And then there's positive rights, that is rights that are given by government or um, uh, ex accepted by governmental law. They're, they're created by statute, we would say, they're statutory rights. Um, so that that's more of a modern uh, view of rights, whereas what I'm suggesting about the 18th century and the founding generation is they very much were steeped in the language of natural rights. That is the notion that there are certain essential rights of man, that is all human beings by virtue of their existence, their creation, um, that cannot be abridged. Um, and I, I say by God or nature precisely because it is, it is a world steeped in um, uh, both religious thought and enlightenment. And in that world, this natural law, well, it had been important for centuries, but it was very important at that time too, in terms of conceiving of these certain essential rights. Uh, it's not that governments couldn't infringe upon those rights. It's just that the governments didn't create those rights. They existed because you were an individual human being. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's a different concept of freedom is, is related, but different. We, sometimes we think of liberty too, in the sense that it can both be something that it, it can have positive and negative ends in terms of how the framing generation would have thought of this too, because freedom can both mean um, you are giving the essential rights to sort of do the things you need to to contribute to human society. And it can be excessive in the sense that it can also be um, harmful or um, uh, not, uh, licentiousness is the word they would have used, but that's that has to be defined. That's a word we don't really use anymore, but it's an 18th century word to say, look, there's a downside to all this too. There's such a thing as too much freedom in terms of, uh, we also need to have a well-ordered society. That is to say, they would have thought that law, liberty, order all go next to each other in creating a society, right? Because you come in with rights ordained by your creation, but then you create a representative democracy under the constitution. So I just gave you theory to try and explain these, but it's a really good question that gets at Part of what we're doing here is to put you back into this past. It's a foreign country. They thought of things differently. 
And that's why rights sound a little bit different to us. And it's a little messy now when we think, well, what's, what is right? What is freedom? What is liberty? Um, it's because things change too. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important. And let me just like really simplify it. And so this will not be a hundred percent perfect, but I think about rights as something that I can demand or call upon that I know that is there and I can say, I have this. I think of freedom as being not a hundred percent, but that, that I can just do and the government can intrude upon. So one is something that it's almost like active that I can go and get and do. And the other one is just existing without government intrusion, unless I go too far, just like a caveat on that. It's like a simple way to think about almost like uh, active and passive, like rights are active and freedoms are passive, that nobody's allowed to touch it unless you go too far um, in just a general context. But the that point that you're making, okay, the, how has this changed over time? It for when we talk about speech, I, I find tendencies that the way they talked about it in the beginning of our country in like the 1780s, 1790s feels very much the way we talk about it today. So let's like real quick, because we've got like 13 minutes. Well, left yes, let's highlight coming. a difference by going to 1798, because you want to talk about an example of how it's also different. 1798 is <laughs> a great example, because yeah, we because started this class by saying like snapshots, right. one, two, three, first snapshot. Yeah, well, so we started this class by saying strongest protections today, right? So let's, we're going back. What, how about 1798? Okay, so the snapshot is we're in a quasi war with France. Quasi just means there's no declared war, but there's fighting on the seas. It's an undeclared naval war. This is happening because Britain and France are at war with each other. United States doesn't necessarily unpick sides, but it's a political battle between new political parties. There's the Federalist. John Adams is the second president. He's a Federalist. They favor the British. They do not like revolutionary France. The Jeffersonians, his vice president, is the head of the party. They favor France. They see Britain, Britain is the continued enemy. New political parties mean newspapers, too. They mean party newspapers. This is a time of growing an intense partisanship. And part of that partisanship is these partisan newspapers where they print scandalous critical essays of the president. So in 1798, that's what's going on. John Adams, he's the second president. There's a potential war brewing. Partisan warfare is very bad. He's reading in the paper every day from these Jeffersonian editors just how bad he is. And they're in very personal terms. And it's in that context that the Federalist allies in Congress write the Alien and Sedition Acts. So that's the first snapshot. The second is, what are we talking about? Okay, there, one thing to note is there are two acts here. So there's an Alien Act, which has to do with making naturalization of immigrants harder and actually gives the president power to deport uh, immigrants from an enemy country. That's separate. That's the Alien Act, right? So that has to do with immigration and deportation. There's the Sedition Act, which has to do with making false speech critical of the government criminal, right? Now that false is in there to say that, okay, it has to be false. They, they thought there was an element there that uh, made it less broad, but this was still pretty broad because it's criticism of the government, right? Um, what happens? Well, dozens are put in jail and they're pretty much all immigrant Jeffersonian newspaper editors. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, Jeffersonians are upset about this. So the third snapshot is, what did they argue? Why were they mad? What was their argument against the Alien Sedition Acts? And uh, James Madison, is re who really took the, um, the reins in terms of the constitutional argument. Um, Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolution. So two states basically passed these uh, resolutions in state houses. They are trying to persuade other states to join them to oppose this action by the federal government. And Madison wrote Virginians, and he focused on the constitutional arguments and particularly the First Amendment and said, essentially, look, the heart of the First Amendment, what's in there is, yes, the right of consciousness, certainly, but the right to criticize one's government. What he thought is, if in a free government, in a representative democracy, if you did not have the right to freely criticize your government and its officials, 
then it would threaten all other rights. Because that was essential to this idea of popular sovereignty, that we, the people, are the ultimate authority within this constitutional democracy. If that is not true, because you cannot criticize the government, everything else is threatened. So Madison thought that this was deeply against the grain of the First Amendment. Um, and so hopefully, Curry, that's a quick snapshot. Uh, the yeah. bottom line is it does go away quickly, mostly because the Jeffersonian state power in the very fraught election of 1800, um, they let the act go away and then Jefferson pardons everyone who's still in prison. Uh, so the crisis is over within four years, but it is really the first major debate about the meaning of the First Amendment. And the, the big takeaway that like that I always remember from this, because there are so many moving parts and it's kind of interesting, Alan, just like they're so against it, but they just let it wash away, is that you should be able to criticize your government, all of your government. That is a, the key right that what Jefferson and uh, Madison are saying is, no, 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 the whole point you have free speech, the whole point we went through that revolution was if you don't like something the government's doing, you're supposed to be allowed to criticize them and you shouldn't have limitations. Again, limitations like what Adams was trying to put in. That really quickly, nicely jumps us to where we really see this not happening in our country. And it brings us to the Shank case. So okay. tell us, again, back to espionage and sedition. And so I'm gonna speak in a question. When we're in crisis and our country's in crisis, you know, is and this is a theory question, is free speech as protected as when we're not in crisis? So World War I, there's restrictions on free speech. Woodrow Wilson, tell us the story of Shank. And this is, again, another test of free speech. And then we'll move to modern times. And um, Sean has a great question we're going to wrap up with about how do we protest something today and have free speech in a way that makes change, but we don't get arrested like Shank. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 th I think first, let me just quickly tackle that question within there, which is about crisis itself, which is to say, if we looked at the 19th century before we got to World War I, crisis does often bring about limitations on free speech. So uh, one could say that the abolitionist movement was a crisis to people who both supported it and opposed it. Um, but abolitionists, uh, particularly in the South, faced all sorts of limitations on uh, not only their speech, but their right to assemble, their right um, to print, to print their pamphlets, to distribute them. Uh, so their First Amendment uh, freedoms were routinely limited. Uh, the difference being there that uh, it didn't apply to the states yet. Uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't an inquiry that the Supreme Court could decide, but that was an example. And the Civil War saw that too, in terms of uh, um, those who opposed the war, who opposed some of the war measures, who uh, were imprisoned. Um, and those are important issues uh, in times of crisis in the 19th century. Uh, but what I suggested is true, which is that the Supreme Court didn't really play much of an active role in policing the meaning of the First Amendment really until 1918. They just didn't really say a lot. And World War I is what produced a series of major cases about that meaning. What had happened is, as we see here in part, they brought back the Sedition Act 120 years later. They also passed something called the Espionage Act, the, the Congress did, um, which is actually still around. The Espionage Act has to do with uh, speech or actions that would con consider uh, aiding enemies of the United States. Um, um, and so that, for instance, is how uh, things like uh, Edward Snorton, uh, Snowden was prosecuted for his release of government secrets, has to do with the Espionage Act. Sedition Act was resurrected in 1918. Uh, the Supreme Court ultimately upheld prosecutions under both these acts. Shank is one of those. And the principle in Shank there, so we first we give the example of Eugene Debs. He gave an anti-war speech. This was the socialist leader, a former candidate for president. Unanimously, the Supreme Court upheld the prosecution of him under the Sedition Act. 
for giving a speech critical of the war. Schenck was similar. This was, uh, many of those opposed to the war were socialists and communists and, 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 and other relatively uh, minority political actors um, who opposed, amongst other things, the use of a draft to create an army. Um, and so they put out pamphlets to say, hey, avoid the draft, avoid the war, don't take part in this. And uh, some of the leaders were prosecuted for this. And the Supreme Court said, yes, you can do this. And the words within that, uh, um, the justification given by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes was essentially that in times of war, the difference is Congress has war powers. So Congress decides how to prosecute a war. They create the army, they regulate it, they declare war. If they see potential expression or conduct that could interfere with those powers, generally, in, in those times, they, they have a right to regulate. This was the clear and present danger test, which I believe we, that's our next quote, right, Curry? We can show them the, uh, the precise language of this test. Yes, there you go. When words in such circumstances and are of such nature as to, clear a, to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils Congress has a right to prevent. That was what I was talking about. Congress has power over war. So if there's clear and present danger, um, then yes, that might be an occasion in which expression can be limited. And that's why they said, yes, you could um, support that sort of um, prosecution. So I know we only have a couple minutes. So, yeah, so where we do we want to about... move from there? Do, where, how do we want, what do we want to transition to? Uh, yeah, real quick to connect the dots. When we think about these, these speech cases, they were speeches that Debs were giving against the yep. war. They were leaflets being dropped at parades, almost so like gatherings. So we're talking about this as you know, speech in the big sense of it. So you're at, you're giving speeches, you're at parades, you're giving out papers. Like the abolitionist movement, anti-slavery was sending you know letters to the South saying slavery is wrong. All these things are considered speech. Now I'm almost you know kind of thinking about. How do we understand speech in the classroom and kind of jumping from that to real quickly wrap up speech in the classroom today? And the question that Sean, our student, asked is not just speech in the classroom, but how do you stand up and speak out against things? And, and it has changed very much. So let's skip the classroom for a second and let's do the Brandenburg case, because I think that really sets a new horrible image be prepared for its students. Um, but it really sets a new context, doesn't leave us in World War II, but brings us up to the 1960s and saying, what kind of uh, parade protest is allowed? And what kind of free speech is protected? Why is it protected? And then if you do want to stand up, uh, not that they did, but stand up against things that are wrong, what are some of the things that you would do, like the civil rights movement, to ensure that you can have free speech? and not be arrested for it? What are the rules kind of regulations that they follow? But give us the framing on how protective is speech today with the Brandenburg case? Yeah, so Brandenburg basically replaces Schenck, although it doesn't, it, it kind of does it silently is, is the way legal scholars would put it. Um, but the Brandenburg test has to do uh, with what we would call incitement. That's the legal term. Um, and basically what Brandenburg is very protective because even for violent speech, um, it is very hard for the government to prove that it can regulate because it has to meet a three-part test. So in order to, uh, for, for government to so, limit- Nick, real quick, just tell us the story of what yeah. happened. Like they're well, looking at the so, image, like what yeah, happened? There's, as the image suggests, is there's a KKK Ku Klux Klan rally in Ohio in 1964. There were television cameras there, their crew sent there. And they, so they caught on camera a speech being given by the, the local leader in which he essentially, uh, amongst other things, um, blamed the problems of the country on uh, the Jewish people and African-Americans and suggested a march on Washington um, directed towards the leadership there. Um, it was uh, hating the leadership in Washington. We should go do something. And he was arrested uh, under a state law. 
And what the Supreme Court said was, well, the problem is, yes, there was, there was hateful language. There was suggestion maybe of doing something, but it wasn't going to immediately happen. It wasn't clear if it would happen, when it would happen, to who. Um, it, in other words, it, it felt more like the sort of vague rhetorical violent impulses as opposed to actual likely imminent threats. So that's the language they used is, um, in order to read something like incitement, that is incitement of violence, you have to prove three elements that well, we talk about. So it has to be directed to produce a violent act. It has to be imminent and it has to be likely to do so. And it's hard to prove all three things. It very, very rarely happens. So as a result, Brandenburg sort of sets the bar going forward that the Supreme Court continues to follow, that is very perspective of speech, even hateful speech. And that includes things famously, like in 1978, the ACLU's defense of the Nazis parade in Skokogi, Illinois, um, uh, even before uh, a largely Jewish uh, uh, minority community. And so when we think about this, and like, and we feel like this one for for so many times we talk about this, it still feels so shocking. Like okay. clearly, you know, you're like, these are this is wrong, but we're still protecting it. We protect speech. But there's there's definitely places where you can't it's not all speech is protected. There's always limits on speech. And schools, public schools can be one of them, but it also doesn't mean the other side of it. So flash forward now back to schools, we're looking at kind of the landmark case about public school speech and the, the famous line, you know, students' rights do not end at the schoolhouse gate. And so for our students that are thinking about this and saying like, if we want to, you know, we look at the civil rights movement, we look at all these things, there's lots of things you can do to ensure that your speech is protected, but some speech is more protected than others and some locations are more restricted than others. Public schools are more restricted, but hey, guess what? Political speech is more protected. So real quick, wrap us up with this um, story about the Tinker, the Tinker sibling. Uh, yeah, so I, it, as you say, it's the story is telling us why things are different in the public school context. So you might say there's that famous quote about the school hall store. I would say it also should say, read more of the opinion, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, because that quote says something, which is, yes, you have First Amendment freedoms in the school, but, but what else, right? So what did they do? This is a brother and sister, public high school, it's during the Vietnam War. And they wore, as you can see here, these peace arm brands to protest the war. Uh, the school officials felt that this was disruptive to the classroom. Um, and so they were punished. Supreme Court said, you can't punish that speech, but it's important why they said that, right? So yes, there's that famous, famous quote, but what they were really saying was, if you look at the facts of this case, they didn't actually disrupt the school environment. This was a silent, symbolic, peaceful protest, right? It was mere expression. So they didn't say anything. They weren't yelling against the war. They weren't outside. They weren't bashing. It. They, no, no, they were just wearing, uh, wearing the armband. And so that was the test that the court actually set going forward was what you have to ask is, was this speech or conduct substantially disruptive to the school environment? And what they meant by that is the school environment, public schools are different because officials have a need to create discipline and order because they're acting um, in loco parentis, that is in place of the parents. Uh, and therefore they do have more prescriptive powers to limit certain speech and expression that would disrupt that environment. Uh, so it is different. And that means going forward, the tinker test actually employed in later cases does mean certain limitations like school newspapers. Uh, that's the Hazelwood case of 1988 in which uh, the Supreme Court said, yes, uh, school officials can uh, limit certain publications. That is in this instance, they, they wanted to say, no, you can't print these stories and editorials about controversial subjects like uh, birth control, uh, uh, things like that, right? It's, 
and said, look, if it's got a pedagogical purpose, that is, if it's related to the educational minute and it's reasonable, then yes, yeah, school officials can do it. Similarly, about 20 years later, in what we call the Bong Hits for Jesus case, which is um, Morris versus Frederick, the Supreme Court said, yes, the student who held this banner across the street from the school could be punished because school officials said that um, banner, even though the student says it was a joke, could look like an endorsement of illicit drug use, which is against school rules. And the Supreme Court said, yes, it could. To an observer, even if the student says it wasn't his intent, it could look that way and that's disruptive of the school environment. And so in those cases, those are limitations that outside the school environment will not be okay, but it was different because of the particular context of school. Um, and I know we have to wrap up here, Nick, and thank you so much for getting us from 1789 to this <laughs> really quickly. Um, students, this was a real quick sneak peek through the years. And the one other case that I just want to shout out to you all should look up and check out Mahoy Area School District, and I always say that wrong, uh, versus BL, but check it out because these two are really interesting to look at together and say, when does the school have the power? When does the school not have the power? And how does cell phones change it? So, so much more to talk about. Nick, thank you so much for joining in today. I will, Nick will be here again at two o'clock if anybody is joining us for the two o'clock session as well. We'll see how far we get it too. Thank you so much, students. Great questions, great class, and everybody have an awesome day. And Uriel, I'll send you what that means. <laughs>